Hey guys, have a good, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for watching Critical Beauty Salon tonight. We have a special guest, Marissa Page Butler, Miss Earth USA 2021. If you have any questions for her, just shoot them up in the comment section or rather in the chat um, box on my channel. So we're just waiting for her to log in. Hope everybody's doing fine. Okay, I think she is logging on right now. Okay, I think, just waiting. Okay, let's take, let's admit her. Hey. Hi, how are you? Let me start the video. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, you? <laughs> you're, you're, uh, you're like, uh, yeah, Zoom. So, yeah, Zoom likes vertical, doesn't it? <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. You're using an iPhone? I am, yes. Four? Okay. Well, see, I see your crown and your sash. Yes, they're right here. <laughs> I know that you wanted me to have it with me. So, I, I know that they don't really like you wearing it because. When it sits, it just says Miss Earth because USA is down here, so they don't yeah. like that it looks like that on camera. <laughs> so did you did you read uh, Laura's email to to both of us because she well she was concerned that if I had to wear Mister Dirt twenty 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 one, she thought I was like going to uh, insult the Miss Earth organization, which Aww. is crazy. Okay, you know what I mean? Because I was trying to inject some humor into the into the conversation. <laughs> And of course, you know, I just said, okay, well, fine, you know, let's do a normal chat because I don't want them to give the impression that uh, I'm dissing Miss Earth. None whatsoever. I love, love, love Miss Earth because <laughs> it's it's officially the uh, the third biggest pageant in the world, and uh, every year it attracts more and more countries, and it's the only major pageant in the world that has an actual, real platform. You know, yes, uh, I love that advocacy. <laughs> And that's why it, it has attracted so many countries from all over the world. And I mean, which country does not have an environmental problem? You know what I mean? There's not one. Exactly. It's so there's relevant. One. Yeah. So <laughs> so there's every country in the world. I'm sure even the Vatican City has its own trash and litter problem. You know? Especially yes, of when course. Tourists, yeah, when tourists go and, and they just like litter all over the place and whatnot, and you see all these poor, poor priests and nuns and monks picking up you know, the trash of these uh, stupid tourists and whatnot. So yeah, every every. Oh, I understand definitely. You know, I've actually had the chance to go to the Vatican once with my mom, and even then, you know, it it's like any other big public space. You know, if there's a lot of people, there's going to be litter, and there's always going to be problems. Um, so I definitely understand that's is so relevant. That's why I love this organization so much. Yeah. Now, do me a favor. Could you like make your camera closer to your face? Because I see a lot of dead space above your head. Yes. Yeah. So, when it was horizontal, it was a little better frame. Let me get of this. The, the whole planet Earth wants to see your beautiful face. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pull this closer. Much better. Better? Wonderful. Thank you. I did see your interview with Adam Gennato the other day. Yes. And when he mentioned that you resemble Jimena Navarrete, Miss Universe 2010 <laughs> from Mexico, I sort of like am seeing the resemblance right now. You guys, you, you girls could be like twin sisters. 
<laughs> I love that because it was funny when I first started pageantry was actually when she was finishing her reign. So she was the first Miss Universe that I followed more closely. Yeah. Um, and one of the women kind of inspired me to get going. So I always think it's kind of fun when it like comes full circle and everyone's like, oh, you look so much like her. It's like, well, I've only that's all I ever aspire to be. She's so stunning. So that's such a compliment. So thank you so much. Yeah, she is. I think she's married right now. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. she's married. I'm not sure if she has any kids, but, you know, but anyway, you know, yeah, I, I see the resemblance right now. Now, you're a pageant veteran. Okay, I know that you competed in several pageants before, like uh, Miss USA system, you were Miss Maine USA, and then you transitioned to Miss World America, and now you're competing, you know, in, uh, in Miss Earth. People think beauty queens who jump from one system to another some of them think, well, she's just a crown chaser. She just she just wants to collect crowns. She's not really there for the pageant. You know, she just wants to win just for the sake of winning. What do you tell these people? Well, I would say that, you know, I think it really focuses on your why. Why are you competing in pageantry? And for me, it's always been the journey. So instead of a crown chaser, I like to think of myself as a dream chaser, as someone who's chasing after the best version of herself. And I think that there's been nothing in my life that I have experienced other than pageantry that's given me such a chance for personal growth and development. And I really enjoyed every single stop along the way in my pageant journey because that's what has brought me here. Is what's brought me here as the person I am who is going to be ready to take on this responsibility. So I think that, you know, it, it really boils down to what your why is. Why are you competing? And for me, it's always been that personal development and also to be able to develop myself so that I can share my purpose and my advocacy with the world in the most efficient way possible on the largest scale. So that has always been my driving force. And so that's why I always like to say, instead of a crown chaser, I'm a chaser of dreams. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, not only that, but I think every every pageant is different though. Um, yes. Uh, like, you know, of course, Miss Universe, you know, it's one of the oldest, biggest pageants in the world, Miss World at the same time. Whereas Miss Earth is, you know, is growing um, every year. And, um, but I mean, I, I tell people, listen, you know, no, there's nothing wrong with being a crown chaser. I mean, I'd be happy to be to be called as a crown chaser. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not so much just collecting crowns, but it's like what you said, it's, it's all about developing your personality because you, the Marissa Butler from two years ago is not the same as the Marissa Butler today. Correct. And you know, in, in a week, like a week or two weeks from now, <laughs> you're going to be a better person, you know, so to speak. So yeah, I um I like that answer. Thank you. Of you have course. a lot of friends, Marisa, don't you? I do, mostly all through pageantry. So that's another reason why I've enjoyed my long journey in different systems. It's allowed me to meet such amazing people from all over the world. And they're all women who are really making a difference in their communities. And that's something I really admire. Are you still in touch with your former competitors from other pageants? Oh, of course. Uh, we were actually were planning a reunion trip for my Miss uh, USA class from 2016. Unfortunately, you know, with the pandemic, it made it a little bit harder. We're hoping to be able to still do it in September. So we'll see if I'll be able to go. I might be off competing. Um, so it'd be really sad to miss it, but it's definitely for a good reason. Um, and then, you know, they've actually all really supported me along my journey. Uh, so Amani, who is both a sister from USA and also now from Earth, um, it has always been very supportive. Um, Deshana, who had won my year at Miss USA, has been very supportive. I still talk a lot with my Miss World sister, specifically Vanessa. I mean, this is even her dress. <laughs> she, she gave this to me. So, you know, wow. like they are all so supportive. And I really believe that they are truly the reason why I've been able to become the person I am today. Because at every single pageant, I've made an amazing new friend that I have learned something from. And I think that's the biggest takeaway I always like to give uh, as far as girls with advice if they're going into their first pageant um, is try to make friends and especially try to make friends with the women who intimidate you. Right. Because if a woman intimidates you, it means that you admire something about her and there's something about her that you wish you had in yourself as well. So instead of having that turn to envy, have that turn to admiration and seek out her friendship because you can grow so much when you surround yourself with the people that you are admiring. And so never let someone uh, intimidate you, but rather 
refocus that in your mind and see it as the admiration and respect that they deserve. Well, which brings me to the next question, since you have so many friends, and of course, well, this is just not limited to your friends, but also your, your, your family and your, your loved ones. If they were to describe you in three adjectives, besides intimidating, <laughs> name three <laughs> other adjectives, go. <laughs> So I would say the first one would be goofy. So I know that most of my pageant fans might not see this side of me, but my close friends definitely see my goofy and silly side. So I think that'd be the first thing that they would say. Um, the second one I think would be supportive just because I really do want to see my friends succeed. Like I said, I, I don't see them through an envious lens. I see them as someone I really want to succeed in life. I think something that really encapsulates that was my reaction when Vanessa won Miss World. Even though I was competing against her, I was screaming, jumping up and down just as much as if I had just been called as right. the winner of the pageant. So I say supportive is another one. Um, and then I think that the last one just would be kind. Um, I know it kind of falls in with supportive as well, but I think it's so important that we always are speaking kind words to our friends and those around us, because I think that's one of the things that the world really lacks enough of is kind people and kind comments um, just because we're in this world where so many people can be negative. Um, so I think that it's really my duty to uplift my friends um, and speak kind words to them. Excellent. You know what? Because I think a lot of people, uh, especially those toxic uh, fans who love, 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 love to destroy queens behind a keyboard, they don't understand the amount of preparation that yes. you know, young women um, have to engage in in order to compete. They they don't they don't understand how hard is it for them to be able to develop you know their, their self esteem, their self confidence, you know, and everything. And mm -hmm. usually, most of these keyboard warriors are people who have never personally attended any pageant, who have never personally worked with any pageant girl whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They just love 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 to promote negativity and 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 destruction. You know, so. Mm -hmm. People out there, you negatrons, I call them negatrons. <laughs> if you're watching the show, stop. Stop bashing <laughs> all these girls, all these women because they've worked so hard. Okay, okay. Now, <laughs> we, are, we all have social media. We all love social media. Now, if a potential employer looked into your social media account, what would they found out about you? Because as you know, we don't necessarily put everything out there in the open. Yes. Well, I think the one thing that would really shock them is how glam I can get. Because when I go into an interview, I, when I'm working in my uh, industry, which is financial advisor, I mean, I'm the only woman usually in the room. So I'm really not trying to bring any more attention to myself than I need to because I'm already sticking out like a sore thumb. So I always I go with very natural makeup, my hair in a like low ponytail. Um, so I think they'd be surprised by the glam side of me that my Coworkers never get to see. Um, but then I also think as an employer, they'd be very impressed with my environmental work. Um, if you go in my profile, you'll also see all of my We Clean Trails cleanups. Um, that's linked right in my bio. You'll also see that I'm an animal lover. I have my dog Milo with me almost everywhere. He goes to the gym with me. He goes anywhere I go. He's always there with me. So I think that those would be a few of the key takeaways that a future employer would find out about me if they went onto my social media page. I'm actually looking at your Instagram account right now. I see a <laughs> lot of amazing um, photographs. A, a, a lot of it. It's like a combination of glam, real world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it just, it just, there's a good balance, um, you know, in, in your, in your social media account. So I really love it. Thank so you. <laughs> now, you said during an interview that, and I'm quoting, financial advisor by day, earth advocate by night and weekends. Now, as Miss Earth 20, USA 2021, do you advise your, your clients to invest, let's say, in environmental friendly businesses and whatnot? Oh, of course. I think that one of the biggest markers of a good leadership within a company is how they handle their environmental impact. In fact, environmentally friendly companies often outperform even as far as profits go because they are having a holistic approach to their leadership team. So I always find that if a company has a strong environmental presence, that it really is an indicator of future profits. So why wouldn't I have my clients be invested in that? I also am very happy that 
that my uh, employer is so supportive of my pageant journey and is actually helping me with developing my own uh, portfolio that is going to have just green uh, companies. So I'll be able to offer a very unique portfolio that is an environmentally conscious portfolio to my investors going forward. And that's something that we're working on right now. And I'm very excited about uh, and hopefully I'll be able to announce and share some of it with you all on my social media. Unfortunately, my industry is very regulated. So it, we do have to go through a lot of background and a lot of hoops to jump through before I can actually post any type of recommendations online since that is very much um, regulated. Uh, but uh, we are working to be able to release some of that for you all. So hopefully you'll get some financial advice from me on my page uh, this year. So that is something very exciting that's going to be coming up soon. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, if you, if you're trying to implement change, I think you can start, you know, from just spreading the word, listen, you know, you need, this company's doing great as far as cleaning the environment. You know, why don't we patronize, you know, their business and so forth and so on. This store, uh, you know, promotes the use of uh, uh, recycled bags. Why don't we go to the store, blah, 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 et cetera. Yeah. You know, they don't, they don't accept plastic bags, et cetera. Some, I think some cities like San Francisco and uh, Berkeley, they started to, uh, I think they got rid of the plastic bags, I think, not too long ago. It's, it's now yeah. prohibited. They find you. If, if yeah, they, I know there are some cities know. in the U.S. have completely prohibited it. I do know in my state that I'm currently living in California, there is a tax on all bags. So if you don't bring a bag to the grocery store with you, you actually would have to pay for that plastic bag. Right. So that's actually helped right. deter people from doing that. Um, and I know I always bring my, uh, you know, reusable bags with me to the grocery store. And I'm such an adamant person about this, that even if I forget them, I will not bag my groceries. I'll take everything out in the cart and load it directly into my car. Cause I was like, you know, that's my fault. I'm going to be the one who has to deal with lugging everything up individually because I forgot my bags. I'm not going to be going out and getting those plastic bags just because I had forgot today. Um, so yeah. that's always another thing. Just uh, I'll put in a little eco tip there for all my earth warriors. If you do forget your right. reusable bags, there are other options. So uh, yeah. <laughs> remember well, that next time. I know, right? Um, actually, I, the, unfortunately, the supermarket where I live, um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, where, in the town where I live in, they have, they sell recycled, the, the, the reusable bags. But when the pandemic um, came, um, they stopped. We had to stop using the recycled bags because mm -hmm. they thought that the virus was somehow yes. was, mm -hmm. you know, uh, infected the, the recycled bags. And now I have like over 30 recyclable bags and I can't use them, even though no matter how many times I would like rewash mm -hmm. them with bleach and all, I still can't reuse them because not, nobody in the grocery store would, would let me use them. So they're just sitting there collecting dust. Oh, well, what, what you should do then is still bring them in your car and then bring the cart out uh, with you and then just bag them in your car and then bring the cart back. That's what I did when they weren't allowing those either. So there's always ways around it. We just have to think more creatively about the problem. And I think that that's true for pretty much any problem that we come across. As long as we put our mind to it and think creatively, we can always find a solution that's good for the environment and good for us as well. That is an amazing idea, Marissa. <laughs> Thank you. I will definitely follow that <laughs> advice for sure. Of Starting course. tomorrow when I go shopping. <laughs> so I learn something new every day, you know. Now, as an ambassador of environment, um, mm -hmm. you know, you will meet, or I'm sure you've met people who just don't believe, let's say, um, in global warming. You know, there's mm -hmm. still people who deny that it exists, even though there's a lot of scientific evidence uh, that would say otherwise. But how do you convince people that global warming exists? I mean, first of all, do you think global warming exists? <laughs> Well, I do believe in data and science. So yes, I do believe that global warming exists. I do think that one of the main reasons why people are apt to believe that it's a hoax is because that's a much easier narrative to digest. 
Because if we are able to say that, oh, it's not because of anything that we're doing, that defers our responsibility to something else and deflects, you know, the responsibility for us to take care of the issue. And so I feel a lot of people were so quick to believe this hoax because they don't want to put in the effort to change the way that they live and to really research about what it is that is causing it and how can we stop it going forward? Because let's see what the two options are is do nothing or change a lot about your life and do a lot. And I know that is that's the easier option for a lot of people is to just believe that it's a hoax. Um, but for me, I think that the way that you break through to people like that is not by approaching them, like saying they're crazy or they don't know what they're talking about, but really try to sit down and understand where it is they're coming from why it is they hold the beliefs that they have. And then that way you can best strategize how to reach them and make them understand that this isn't just an opinion. This is something that is rooted in science and data. This is a fact. We have had a uh, global temperatures rising consistently uh, as for as long as we've been able to record temperatures. And especially that has been spiking since the 1970s and been vastly accelerated. And that correlates exactly when we started using more fossil fuels. We started uh, emitting more CO2 and our population has grown. So all of those things are interconnected and anyone who has a statistical background like myself, it's very clear to see with the numbers, but I know not everyone sees things in numbers. So one of the ways that I always try to get through to people like that is actually taking them out into nature. I think that one of the great examples is to show a area that used to be pristine and beautiful picture of what it looked like maybe, you know, 50 years ago, and then bringing them to that same exact spot today and seeing how the environment has degraded. Um, Also looking at at all the animals that have been losing their habitats and also have gone extinct during this time due to not being able to keep up with the rapid changing temperatures and the rapid changing environments that they used to call home. So by really making it personal to people, I think is a really great way to get through. Um, But it really does, like I said, start with understanding why they hold the beliefs that they do in the first place so that you can find the best strategy to approach um, them so they can understand what it is you're trying to convey. You know, when 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 people ask me, do you believe in global warming? I, I used to not believe in it only because I was very skeptical of, mm-hmm. of the scientific data. But I think the more I did my research and the more uh, National Geographic videos I saw, the more mm-hmm. I was inclined to believe. I once saw a video of this Pacific Island nation of Nauru which is mm-hmm. a teeny weeny, teeny weeny like, like strip of, of, of island uh, in, in the vast Pacific Ocean. And then every year, I think the country loses like about like, uh, like four feet of land because, because of the rising yeah. um, you know, ocean water, sea, sea yes. level. And, and then I realized, gee, this is interesting. I, I feel so bad for those people. You know, they have nowhere to go. I think some of them, have been forced to migrate to New Zealand or maybe Australia, mm-hmm. but the, the country itself is shrinking because of rising uh, sea level. So that's one thing that a lot of uh, anti-global one people, you know, should look into because it's it, that's reality. Now I have a, another issue with people who think that the Earth is flat. <laughs> like, really. <sighs> There's a flat <laughs> earth movement. Come on, come on, Miss Earth USA. Are you flat or round? Come on. Oh, round for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh. What is wrong with these people? Like, how do you convince this, this flat earth movement people that they're that flat is not flat? You know? <laughs> well, I think the easiest way would call up Elon Musk and put all of them on a spaceship and let them see it from uh, outer space themselves. I think that would yeah. be the easiest way to convince every single one of the non-believers. Um, but again, I, I know that that's not really feasible. If you, we would just get everyone saying they're a flat earther just so they could go up into outer space on one of those spaceships. Uh, so I think, again, it really is just about understanding 
what logic they use to come to that uh, conclusion. Because then you can always reverse engineer that and show them that they, the logic that they are following to come to that conclusion is flawed and do so in a respectful manner. I think the first thing we need to do is, you know, not approach them like they're crazy. I know it's hard. You're like, well, this is like the most obvious fact. Of I do. World. You're crazy. <laughs> the earth is round. <laughs> but if you approach it that way, uh, if you approach it with saying that someone is just wrong, flat out wrong, you're not trying to understand their point first, you're going to lose them. You're, you're never going to win an argument by yelling. You're only going to be able to win an argument by sitting down and understanding the logic of the person sitting across from you. So uh, that would be probably my more practical approach of getting them to be able to believe the earth is round. Um, but the more fun one would definitely be calling up Elon Musk. <laughs> well, it's funny because, um, you know, remember like uh, during the Middle Ages, uh, people, a lot of people thought that the earth was the center of the galaxy of the universe until, yes. until Galileo discovered, no, it's not true. It's, it's, this, it's the earth that we, all these nine planets revolve around the sun and not the sun rotating around the planet. So that was a big, big, and for that, for telling the truth, he was, uh, he was burned at the stake. <laughs> so, yes. I, mean, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Luckily, we don't burn people at the stake and believe that the earth is flat. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, that is very true. <laughs> so that's progress, at least, you know. Now, um, you mentioned also, I believe, in, in Adam Giannato's interview, that you're gradually transitioning into vegetarianism. Yes. Um, do you encourage everyone to do the same? Because not everybody, of course, can... It's not easy for a lot of people to be vegetarian or vegan. But do you yes. encourage people to go vegetarian one day? I think that if you have the health and the financial ability to become a vegetarian, I 100% uh, endorse doing so and attempting to do so. Because at the end of the day, with our population always rising, we need to make sure that we are uh, providing food for ourselves in the most sustainable way possible for this planet. And crop production takes up much less land space. It actually can even be done indoors. Whereas cattle production takes up a lot of land, takes a lot of water and resources. And that is really detrimental because it's causing people to cut down our forests and our rainforests that are really vital to keeping our planet healthy. So I would say that if you have the financial ability and your, your doctor believes it is a healthy move for you, then I would 100% do it. But if you're not able to fully transition to be vegetarian, I think that the really important part is to look at what meat products and animal products are most environmentally detrimental and cut those ones out first. So for me, for example, I only eat chicken and fish still. And that's the only reason I am still eating that is because I was vegetarian, fully vegetarian for a better part of last year. Um, but I did get into a bad car accident and I was still continuously getting sick. My body was not recovering. So my doctor did suggest that I added protein back into my diet in the form of meat. Um, I would love to be able to get to the point where I no longer eat meat. That is my end goal. Um, I just have to work doing it slowly uh, with my nutritionist to make sure that I'm doing so healthy and also in a way that's sustainable for me. I know for me, when I first started, it was a whole new world. I had to learn all new recipes, different ways of shopping. Uh, and I think it's a really great growing experience, but it can be very overwhelming if you do it all at once, because you're essentially jumping into a whole new world and you don't know the rules. So I think that it's really important to, if you do want to go to vegetarianism, I, I really applaud that movement. I, I think that is a great step, um, but I would make sure that you're doing so in a healthy way and only doing so if you can financially afford it. I know that a lot of times vegetarian foods and high quality organic foods are more expensive. So it can be a limiting factor for those who are not financially secure. Uh, so I wouldn't want to put too much guilt on someone who isn't able to do that because they can only really afford food that they can afford. And I wouldn't want to make anyone feel bad about not being able to be a vegetarian for that reason. So I think that if you have the ability to, you 100% should. That way, for those who cannot, you're taking on some extra, you know, goodwill for the earth uh, because you have the ability to where others might not be able to. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> Um, as far as not being able to afford, like, you know, healthy, organic, vegetarian food, mm -hmm. 
I'm lucky. I live in a small town in um, mm-hmm. southeastern Massachusetts, you know, near Providence. And my town uh, is opening um, a community garden. Oh, um, so wonderful. Yeah, basically to, uh, you know, to provide, you know, fresh organic fruits and vegetables to, to less fortunate people you know, in the town. I really believe that we need to cultivate our own garden, as the French philosopher Voltaire used to say. Yes. I think every city, every community, every town in America or everywhere in the world should have a community garden where people can just freely plant whatever they want to grow and then, you know, and be able to harvest and then mm-hmm. share this food with everybody. Um, I think there's a lot of food in this world, but the problem is a lot of these food, um, like surplus food, are not really going to the right people who are most in need, mm-hmm. which is really very sad. And mm-hmm. that promotes even more hunger and, and illnesses, especially you know, with, with children all over the world. So that needs to stop. But you know, right now, you know, there's so many ways that you can grow your own vegetable in your house. You, you're familiar with, with hydroponics, that use that system of, of, yes. of, um, plant, of plants being raised by w- water alone, no, no soil, just yes. water. <laughs> and when I saw a video of that, oh my God, I can do that in my house. I can do that, you know, uh, on the roof of my building where I live, et cetera. So possibilities are endless as far as raising your own vegetable, you know? So yeah, or what about um, uh, if you don't have time or if you're too lazy to uh, do your own gardening, what about freeganism? Have you heard of that of the, of that movement, a freegan? Yes, it was <laughs> funny. I was just re-watching Parks and Recreation uh, yeah, yeah. and they they were talking about that in like, the last episode I was watching with the new ROM that came in. Um, but yes, uh, so about utilizing scraps and uh, things that have been discarded uh, instead of new items. So that was my understanding of that. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's so much scraps and you think about all of the um, all of the restaurants. I mean, just in my town alone, uh, in San Diego, in North Park, there are so many restaurants and the amount of waste that is created. And then you will see these people who are homeless sitting out in front of these uh, restaurants and they're starving. And, you know, it, it doesn't take much to be able to give those people the extra food rather than throwing it into the garbage. And then also it also, if you were able to give it directly to them rather than them having to rummage through the garbage, that is only helping that person's self-esteem It's helping that person's sense of self-worth because they're not having to go through a dumpster just to be able to get a meal and sustain themselves. So I think that there is a lot of ways that we can utilize scraps at restaurants and in grocery stores. I know a lot of like Trader Joe's gives away a lot of their uh, food that is going to start going bad. Uh, before it's bad, they give it to food shelters so that it can, it can be used and doesn't go to waste. So I think that more organizations need to have programs in place like that because there is enough food in this world for us all. It's just a matter of that we have overconsumption, we have greed, and that really limits the amount of food that is able to get to those who actually need it most. So I really love that concept. I really do think that more companies should be enforcing uh, strategies like this going forward. Well, not only food, but also clothing. Yes. Um, well, I have a story about that, actually. My you know? very first job I had ever had was in a retail store. And I remember how horrified I was when I was going through my employee uh, orientation. And they were telling us that if there was ever a rip or a defect in the clothes, that we would have to collect it and send it away. And so I had asked, so what do they do with that? Do they donate it to someone? They know they burn it. I was like, why would they burn it? And it's because they didn't want their brand associated with people of low socioeconomic classes. And I was so appalled by that, that I ended up not working there because I just couldn't be with a company that had that as their uh, policy. So I definitely agree with you that clothing should definitely be used uh, and donated if it's not going to go to the final customer. It definitely should at least be repurposed and given to someone who really needs it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) The other day I was watching, a. uh, I love Netflix documentaries. I was watching a documentary about uh, the Amish in uh, Pennsylvania, and I was just so impressed by the simplicity of their lifestyle. I mean, talk about you know self uh, sustainability. 
Wow. Yes. I mean, amazing. I mean, obviously, you know, they, they only wear, I mean, the guys, I know they only wear like a, a specific type of pants and they have like suspenders and always the same mm-hmm. crispy white or blue or white shirt. And the women, you know, wear the simple, you know, frock with a little bonnet and whatnot. And they raise their own animals, their own vegetable farms, et cetera. And I, and I'm, and I asked myself, can I really live like one of them, you know? And then I realized, I don't think so because they don't have YouTube. <laughs> they, they don't watch YouTube. They won't be able to see my channel. <laughs> so, <Aww. laughs> you know, just kidding. No offense to the Amish community. I love you people. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's, but I'm very, very impressed by a group of people mm-hmm. who have been living like that for centuries. It's just amazing. And they're all clean. They're all, they all mm-hmm. they recycle. They repurpose everything. Nothing goes to yes. waste. You know, I definitely think there is a lot we can learn from them. We actually have an Amish community in Maine uh, near where my family grew up. My father and mother were from Union, Maine area, and there is an Amish community there. And so my father had just recently inherited a blueberry farm. Um, However, it was something he inherited from his uncle. It was halfway through the season. He's like, well, I have no idea what to do with all these blueberries. So he called up the Amish community. They came and took a lot of blueberries. He called up all the wildlife preserves. They brought blueberries to feed to their wildlife patients. So, you know, it's always about if you have the ability to share something, make sure that that is your very first step rather than letting something go to waste. And I'm really happy that I have my parents to look up to as role models in that regard, because they always make sure that if there's any excess, any surplus that they have in their, their life, they are taking care of other people. And I think that's really what has made me into the woman I am today and the values that I have. And that really ties in with what we're talking about right now about, you know, this is a collective earth, you know, this isn't just for one person. And we need to realize we're all a team. We are all team earth. We are all one humanity. And we need to make sure that we are helping out our neighbor when we have the ability to do so. Uh, so I absolutely love all these ideas that you're talking about. Um, and definitely, definitely would be practicing that myself uh, going forward as well. So uh, how many pairs of shoes do you own now? Oh, I don't know. I always end up giving them to my friends. <laughs> <laughs> if I end up not liking them, I really, honestly, I have like two or three pairs of shoes that I really love to wear and I wear them a lot. I really try to stick to nudes and then like a basic black and I have a favorite that I have there. Um, but I have a lot of friends actually who have the same exact shoe size as I do. So one thing that we do is we actually like trade shoes like round robin. So that way if we ever get bored of one of our yeah. shoes or want to try something different. In fact, I have a, a one of my friends has a shoe that matches this outfit perfectly so when I wear it out I call her up and borrow those shoes so I think I would definitely you know suggest people to start doing that that way you're not buying so many extra things that you don't need all the time um or you know being able to rent them as well is another good option so um I try not to do too many shoes just because I live in a small apartment I don't have a lot of space um and if I had too many shoes I would just be overwhelmed but I I will say I used to have a lot when I went to Miss USA, I, I know that the average shoes that the, a girl brought to Miss USA was like 25. I brought 20. So I was a little on the low side of how many shoes I brought to Miss USA. But after that, I, was like, I can't do this. There's too many shoes in my house. I have to get rid of them and end up giving them to a lot of my friends. Um, so that's kind of how I handle it, especially being a pageant girl. You have to have <laughs> shoes. But I, I definitely try to limit the number that I have. <laughs> You know, it's funny because I have like, I don't, I, I've lost count. I think I have like over 50 pairs of shoes and I haven't <laughs> worn like 85% of them. Mm-hmm. I keep them, I keep, I have two sheds, a big shed and a small shed. I keep all my old shoes um, up in the attic of the big shed. And you know, they're in, in big, humongous black plastic bags. And I don't have, I just don't have time to throw them out or to give them away. And I've never worn them in like 15, 20 years. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. what am I gonna do with these shoes? You know, just give them away, you know. <laughs> you know <what> <laughs> I think we should yeah. create a job for someone so that their whole 
spiel is going into your house and helping you get rid of your excess things. Yeah. Because I know I never really have enough time. I have a closet full of clothes that I definitely need to go through. Our, our sponsor, Queenly, has been helping me out immensely with that because I've been selling so many of my old wardrobe pieces. I finally am starting to have some room in my closet again, which is really nice. And I also was really fun and because then you end up seeing the pictures of the girls wearing those dresses later on and how happy they look in them. And, and you're just excited because it's like you you were able to be a part of that and contribute to that. And then being able to see that piece of clothing have a new lease on life is just really rewarding to me rather than it just sitting in my closet and never getting worn again. Um, so I definitely love that. But I will say it does take effort. It takes a conscious yeah. effort to resell your clothes or donate your clothes because it takes time out of your life. But I always try to put aside at least a few hours every weekend and decide I'm going to sell these three more things and try to put more things up on my profile and, um, you know, donate more uh, items. My friend Laura loves it when I do this because I always give her first refusal on any of my clothing items. And she takes most of it half the time. She she, she loves those clothing drops that I give her um, pretty frequently. So as far as, do you have like a rule, like let's say how how long do you have to keep a specific clothing before you actually like give it away or sell it and then replace it with a new one? Like a year, two years? I actually, most of the clothing I have in my closet, I've had well over five years. Um, I definitely buy items that are meant to be long-term and higher quality. Um, Fast fashion isn't really my thing. I know it's a lot more affordable. I I wish that I'd be able to, you know, have a different outfit all the time. But if you actually look back through um, my social media, you'll see I reuse a lot of my pieces of clothing time and time again and just style them a little bit differently. Um, but when I decided that I don't think that I'll wear that piece of clothing again, um, that's when I decide to put it up for sale. And that could be you know, maybe after the first time I wear it or it could be after wearing it a hundred times. So it really just depends on when I believe that that item has finished its rotation in my life and is ready to go on to a second purpose. Um, so it's not like a hard rule, um, but it's just about you know deciding, am I gonna wear this piece again? And if not, I shouldn't be holding on to it. I should have let it go to another person who would be needing it. Yeah, but the memories, though, the memories. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was really hard. I actually sold my Miss USA dress recently on oh, Queenly. Right. Um, and that was probably the hardest one just because I knew, you know, it, it, any of your big dresses, you know, the, the ones that you wear in competition, they are mementos of your time. Um, but exactly. I found it was much easier to let go of that one because I'm so happy in the system I'm in. And for me, this really feels like the crowning like moment of my entire pageant career being Miss Earth USA. And so I, I feel like the emotional connection I had to a lot of pieces of clothing now are not the same as they used to be um, before this. And, and now obviously, I probably would never get rid of my Miss Earth USA dress. That one is going to be, you know, saved for all of time at my mother's home, Um, especially because it was created by a dear friend of mine. So they helped me design it and bring it to life. Um, And that was the, you know, the dress I wore when I won the crown that means the most to me out of my entire pageant career because it's the system that speaks most to who I am. So I definitely feel like there's certain things like, a wedding dress or a, um, you know, a my gown. crowning gown, you know, yeah. those things I'll probably hang on to forever because yeah. they're special memories. Um, but if you are going to hold on to something like that, I'd always suggest doing some type of display so that it's not just sitting in a closet forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my mom has like this big, like my room at home is kind of where all of my pageant memorabilia goes to live my mom is my biggest fan I love her so much so I know that we're planning on putting a mannequin in there with my Miss Earth USA gown and my eventual Miss Earth gown um, to have kept as a safekeeping and also for me to be able to share you know with my children someday um, because it is going to be a big part of who I was Mm -hmm. Well, actually, you can actually build a mini museum of all your pageant <laughs> memorabilia. I know and my, charge, my, charge people my dad suggested we fee. donate it to my hometown's uh, town hall because they do have like okay. little areas where they can encapsulate, you know, 
special items for people who had come from Standish. So we might end up donating one of those there eventually. So uh, we'll see where it ends up. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, okay. I have a serious question. Yes. Do you think the overpopulation of humans is um, an impediment to the protection and saving the environment? Because there isn't a day that goes by where, uh, where what, 100,000 ba new babies are born every day all over the world. Mm -hmm. That's a I mean, how much more of these humans can we actually sustain? You know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I think obviously there too much of anything is never good. I mean, even carrots that are healthy, if you eat too many of those, you're going to be sick. And even though I think that every single human life is precious and important, there is going to be a point where it can be too much for our world to sustain if we do not change how we live. I think the bigger questions that we need to focus on are not necessarily overpopulation, but our culture. And our culture, unfortunately, in many parts of the world is very ingrained in consumerism. There is a lot of greed. And like we said, if everyone only took what they needed, and if everyone lived sustainably, I do believe that we'd be able to support our population. But I also think that it's very important that we realize that we need to make sure we are adjusting that as our population gets bigger. So that's why it's so important to teach our youth the importance of protecting our environment and protecting the ecosystems that other plants and animals call home. Because if we spread too far with little regard for anyone other than ourselves, then no, that our earth cannot sustain us forever. But if we do so in a way that is very respectful in a way that is really taking into account the consequences of our actions, then I think that we can sustain our population as is for a much longer period of time than if we didn't make any adjustments. And that's why Miss Earth is so relevant and so important because the mission of Miss Earth is to share those messages. So that is why I love being part of this organization because at the end of the day, we need to shift culture. And that is the hardest thing to change because it is so pervasive uh, and because it was different cultures all around the world that we need to change to be able to show that the environment is so important and have it hold that in high regards. So I, I'd say yes, eventually there would be an overpopulation issue, but I think we can combat that with the proper education and approach toward the environment. Um, actually, I have a theory. One good mm -hmm. way to decrease human population is to educate more girls and young yes, women. exactly. <laughs> because the more they're educated, the more they're aware of their choices mm -hmm. in life. Because I know, of course, there's still countries in the world where, you know, forced marriage of young mm -hmm. girls is still very much a, a practice, which is sad. But I think the more we educate young girls and women, the more they will have more choices. And that includes delay, you know, like marriage or having family life, focus more mm -hmm. on their career and supporting their own, you know, uh, uh, families and whatnot. So I think that's one good way of, uh, you know, decreasing the human population, but in an organic mm -hmm. way. Uh, to also jump a, onto that, I think that is so important that we give women autonomy over their own bodies. We give them access to birth control and give proper sex education. I know that even still in many states in the United States, you know, abstinence is the only thing that is taught in school curriculums. And that has been proven time and time again to not be an effective way of educating our youth to be able to actually practice safe sex and also to not conceive a child. So I think the really important thing is that we give people the knowledge and the tools to be able to you know, practice autonomy over their own body and to be able to have the access to birth control if that is what they would like to do. I also think it's very important that we are working for a male birth control as well. I don't think that all reproductive health should fall on women's shoulders. I think that that 
responsibility should be more evenly shared. Um, and I know that we've all seen that there was a male birth control pill that was tabled because of the side effects. But if you actually looked at the side effects, they were the same exact side effects as what women have been experiencing with birth control for many years. So I'd like to see a revisitation of that so that we can be able to share that responsibility of conception with both men and women, because that is really when we'll be able to have, you know, only children who are, you know, wanted and then people who are ready to be parents to have children come into the world. And I do think that that should be something that should be covered by health care. I, I don't think that that should be a privilege to only those who can afford it, but I think it should be a right to people to be able to decide how, when they want to practice conception. I totally agree. It takes two to tango, people. Yes. <laughs> well, remember that. <laughs> now, um, do you think it's healthy to drink rainwater? <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on where you are. Uh, so I would answer this. It should be. It should be healthy to drink rainwater because theoretically it is the purest form of water. Unfortunately, because of air pollutants and other contaminants, uh, many rainwaters ends up becoming contaminated before you're able to ingest it, which is why many states actually ban uh, the use of um, rainwater harvesting for human consumption. I know even in California, we've banned the, the human consumption of rainwater harvesting. Um, but I do think that there are ways that we can combat that by, you know, decreasing our CO2 emissions and also by educating people on ways in which we can purify the water that's collected that way. Since I do know many people around the world do rely on rainwater harvesting for their water. Um, so there's things such as being able to boil the water first to get out of contaminants, uh, different types of filtration that you can do to the water so it is potable um, for you to use. Uh, so I, I think that the short answer is it should be and it can be. But unfortunately, in many parts of the world, it is not potable at this point. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing response. And I totally, totally agree 100%. Um, okay, people are chiming in, in in my YouTube channel. They're commenting. Let me see. Let me read one. Uh, okay, this is interesting from Addie. Addie saying, hi, Marissa. A lot of pageant fans <laughs> do not consider Miss Earth as one of the major beauty pageants. What is your take on it? Well, I think that Miss Earth is one of the most relevant beauty pageants. So whether it, you classify as one of the big four, I know I personally do classify it as one of the big four beauty pageants, but I think that one of the real things to look at when you're looking at the, you know, how strong a system is, is what their impact is that they're making on the world. And I think that there is few pageants that do as much impact and much work on the ground level as the contestants within the Miss Earth system. And I know personally, having competed in multiple systems, two of the other, you know, big four pageant systems being, you know, Miss Universe with my time at Miss USA, and then also directly at Miss World. Uh, as much as I love my experience at all of those, I can say, without a doubt that I love working with my Miss Earth USA team more than any other directorship that I have ever been a part of just because of how supportive they are, especially in the US where it is run by every single person who's honor board directors is a woman who has been in pageantry before. So they know what it's like to be a contestant and they really focus on making sure that the girls are supported and heard throughout their year. So I personally have, absolutely the most utmost respect for the Miss Earth system, whether it is classified as a big four is irrelevant to me because I know for me, it is the number one pageant. You know what? I totally agree. Uh, when the pa when the Miss Earth pageant began in 2001, I I was very skeptical because I thought, oh, well, this is one of those novelty pageants, you know, it's yes. not going to last. <laughs> and then 2002 came by, 2003, and by 2004, it had already over 70 contestants from all over the world. Yes. And that's when I started, um, you know, taking it very seriously. And I did wrote once in my, in my website that Miss Earth is officially the third largest pageant in the world. Mm -hmm. That was 2004. Now, and it's going to become even, even bigger. Now, uh, another comment from my friend, Jan Michael. Hi, Jan Michael. Um, Marissa's gorgeous and she's well-spoken. Oh. Could there, be a could there be a possible back-to-back -back win for USA? 
What do you think, fans? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so. You know, that is what we're aiming for. But at the end of the day, what I'm really hoping to do is to be able to walk on the Miss Earth stage as the absolute best version of who I am. And if that means that the Miss Earth crown is for me, then that's amazing. But if not, I know that I am going to leave absolutely everything out on that stage when we are at Miss Earth, because this is going to be my last last pageant ever and in a system that I think truly speaks to who I am as a person so I would be beyond honored to be able to have the opportunity to represent this organization that I think is doing such great work all around the world so I really hope so um but we'll have to wait and see just like everyone else <laughs> well, okay uh Jen Michael loves your response and amen to that now uh, <laughs> do you have any guilty pleasure Marissa oh definitely I I love to bake. Um, so I obviously end up eating my creations. So I have probably one too many cookies. Um, but as you, if you, anyone's following me knows, I do work out quite a lot. But, but I also think it's really important to reward yourself and slow down at points. Uh, so I might have more cookies than an average beauty queen, but you know, I, I think I deserve them. <laughs> Okay, that's true. I mean, I don't know of any person who doesn't have a guilty pleasure. If you don't have a guilty <laughs> pleasure, you're not human, okay? Okay. Exactly. Now, name three things that you would never, ever do. Never. Hmm. Well, I think the first one would be I would never litter. I mean, it'd be very counterintuitive. I spent every Saturday picking up litter, so I, I just personally could never bring myself to actually litter. Um, and then... Uh, kind of piggybacking off of that, I also would never smoke cigarettes, not only because it's bad for your health, um, but also it's very bad for the environment. Uh, cigarette butts are the number one most littered item in the world. So I picked up my fair share of them on my cleanups to the point where I can't even look at them anymore. Um, <laughs> and then I'd say the third one is I would never, ever, ever sign up for Elon Musk's decision to go colonize Mars. I, that does not seem appealing really? to me at all. I would never go to Mars uh, because for me, I love our earth. And I think that it's so important to take care of the things you have right in front of you rather than chasing a dream uh, that is takes you out of our universe and away from this problem. I think, is, again, it's about avoidance rather than it is about exploration when it comes to colonizing Mars. And I just love our lush, beautiful earth. Plus Mars is way too cold for me. I moved from Maine to California because I like to be warm. So I definitely wouldn't be moving to Mars anytime soon. <laughs> but wait a minute. So if you won Miss Earth, you would be competing with Miss Mars, Miss Venus, Miss Mercury, <laughs> Miss Pluto, Miss Saturn, and Miss Uranus. <laughs> You have to be nice to them and get to know them better, right? <laughs> that would be funny. That would be like the, I couldn't imagine the first beauty pageant on Mars. So that would be really interesting. I wonder if they would actually fly them four years on a plane just to go, not a plane, but a jet, you know, to go and compete on Earth in a pageant. That's right. Now you mentioned, um, okay, you would never smoke cigarettes. Um, mm -hmm. How would you, like, let's say, what's your take on people who, uh, smoke indoors, regardless of, of a sign that says do not smoke. They sm they still smoke anyway. How do you how would you approach mm -hmm. those people? Well, luckily, where I live in California, not many people smoke uh, as far as percentages. It's getting lower every day. Um, so I don't really experience that much. Um, I, however, have always been very sensitive to smoke. I had asthma growing up as a kid, so it really irritated me when I was around it. Um, and for me, I, I guess the only person in my life who smokes cigarettes is my sister. And I always give her such a hard time about it. Um, I would send her pictures of like what a, a long looks like of a smoker. Um, and when she had kids, I, I started telling her, you know, you need to be around for your kids. Like, yeah. I can't be the one raising your children if I'm off in California. Or something Make her feel guilty. So right? I use guilt. Yeah, I would. Yeah. I use guilt on the people around me when it comes to cigarettes. 
Um, but also I do believe in people have autonomy over their own body. People can make their own choices, but I personally would never do that myself. And I also wouldn't end up marrying or dating someone who has that as a habit either. Mm-hmm. My, I really don't surround myself with people who smoke. So the only person that ever I am around that is smoking is my sister. And it's just, I mean, I don't have an option to avoid her. She's my sister and I love her, uh, but we all make our own choices. Um, but yeah, so I, I always just try to give her the facts and she is working on quitting. So I am very proud of her on that. Uh, we'll see if it sticks and we're hoping it does. <laughs> so, well, I tell, I tell people, listen, if you smoke one cigarette, it takes away 13 minutes of your life already right there, mm-hmm. you know, and kissing somebody who smokes is like kissing an ashtray. No, never. Like I said, that's probably one of my like big absolute no turnoffs. If I was dating someone, I I don't think I could make an exception. They could be like the nicest, best person ever. And if they smoked, it's like, I don't know. I I don't think I could be around that. Uh, Plus the secondhand smoke is just so detrimental to, you know, the people who they're with. So that would also be me putting my body and my health at risk. And someone who's a very big health nut like myself, I just couldn't see myself being around someone who smokes heavily. Um, but you know, like I said, I, I don't want to pass judgment on anyone. I know that addiction is a really hard thing to overcome and I never want to minimize addiction. I have had people in my life who have suffered from addiction. Um, so the best thing I can always do is tell young kids never to even try it, never pick it up because it's not worth the risk of becoming addicted to it and then it controlling your life. Um, so uh, that would be one that I would definitely suggest to anyone that, you know, that should be on your list too, of never to do is never smoke cigarettes, never do an addictive substance, because it really can affect, you know, not only yourself, but your family and your loved ones yeah. when you do have an addiction. <laughs> well, for me personally, it's just the, the odor. I, I cannot mm-hmm. stand smoke odor because it clings on the curtains, it clings on the wall, it clings on your clothes. I just, I mm-hmm. have a very low tolerance, you know, for, for anything like it. Yes. Now. When was the last time you bought something from a yard sale or a secondhand store? So there's a lot of really cool consignment shops in San Diego. I actually got one of my favorite summer outfits at a consignment shop. Um, It's a yellow jumpsuit and I love it so much. I think it's really fun shopping secondhand because you find things that are a lot more unique and it's also a lot more financially feasible as well. Um, But I do, like I said, I do a lot of buying and selling uh, secondhand on Queenly, who's one of our sponsors. And I also do share clothes with a lot of my friends. We we rotate closets all the time. Like I said, this is Vanessa's. So, you know, (laughs) it was like, so I often, most of my clothes are secondhand in one way or another, whether they were purchased in a consignment store or purchased, you know, secondhand online or borrowed from a friend. Um, so that's something I've always done. Even when I went to Miss World, I mean, Deshauna sent me a bunch of clothes that she didn't end up getting to wear at Miss Universe. And I got to use that as part of my wardrobe at Miss World. Oh, nice. So nice. I've always been an advocate for, you know, leaning on your friends and uh, getting help that way. And in fact, I made one of my best friends ever by selling a pageant dress to her online, my friend Daniel Latimer from London. Uh, so yeah, you know, I know that. I know. Hi, Danny. If you're watching, I know her. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. But yeah, so, you ne- you never know what it can what it can take uh, you if you buy something secondhand. It always has so much more character. Right. I think that's one of the biggest advantage of competing in pageants because, again, like you mentioned earlier, you create a huge support of, of friends, a network, you know, of friends who will eventually help you in your future yes. you know, pageant project. So that's great. Now, um, okay, here's an interesting question. If you became president of the United States one mm-hmm. day, what would be the first thing you would do in office, Marissa? Yes. So one of the very first things I would do would be restoring the protected status on many of the lands that were removed from protected status during the Trump administration. Uh, a lot of those lands, they are very oil rich lands and he, he opened it up so that they could be drilled upon. However, they're also very important wildlife preserves. They're Native American lands that, and they also are lands that are very important for paleontologists. That, and so I think it's very important that we restore the protections of those public lands. Uh, and 
on that note, I'd also want to move away from uh, natural gases in the United States. So our transportation section makes up more CO2 emissions than any other industry in the US. And uh, you know, everything is spread out. We don't have a lot of public transportation. Uh, so driving a car is almost a necessary thing within the United States. So I'd like to be able to make subsidies on uh, in either hybrid or electric cars to make them more affordable because as you know, they're so much more expensive than their gas ca uh, counterparts as of now. So if we were able to provide an economic incentive for people to trade in their cars for electric and hybrid cars, I think that could really help lower our CO2 emissions and really help amp up the electric and hybrid car industry in the United States. Well. I don't know about you, but I love horse John carriages myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something about it. We don't need to hire someone to clean up all the poop on the roads, so. though. So that would create jobs. That's there right. we go. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Now, what is your position on uh, the legalization of marijuana? So as you know, in the United States, a lot of states have already legalized marijuana usage, uh, both in my home state of Maine and in the state of California, where I live now, it's fully legal, both for medical and recreational. Um, and I have seen how the medical usages have been so amazing for many people, whether that is people who suffer from epilepsy or seizures, those who are going through chemotherapy, uh, even people who have sleep insomnia. Uh, so th there are so many positive benefits to marijuana and their byproducts hemp can be a really great replacement for cotton that's much more sustainable. However, there's like anything, there's always going to be underlying issues with uh, marijuana because it's something that is new. It's something that we haven't really been able to study uh, very well because it has been illegal for so long. So there is always going to be these things that pop up. And I think the one that really concerns me the most is that there's no real easy way to be able to test someone's level of intoxication when they're driving the same way we would be able to do with a breathalyzer test for alcohol. So I think that that is the number one thing we need to really focus on, on developing uh, before I would be comfortable with it being legal recreationally for everyone, because as you know, people misuse things all the time. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I do think there are so many positives, um, but we always have to be cautious on what the negative side effects could be whenever we're introducing something new to society. Well, you mentioned earlier that one of your guilty pleasures is baking cookies. Have you thought about baking marijuana lace cookies? <laughs> 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 I don't know. Edibles scare me. I don't think I'd ever want to do that myself. <laughs> or at least Maybe CBD, for other CBD people. oil. Maybe that could be my side job someday. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you woke up tomorrow and gained mm -hmm. any one ability or quality, what would you want it to be? I would say if I could gain any ability, I'd want the ability to heal. Um, so my aunt was recently diagnosed with a brain tumor uh, and a brain cancer that um, unfortunately is going to be terminal for her. Um, so if I was able to have any one ability, it would be the ability to heal so I could take away that cancer from her so I could keep her around longer because she's my favorite aunt. Uh, I'm very close with her. And this has been something very hard that I've been dealing with behind the scenes in the past few months. Um, so I think that that would definitely be the number one reason because I'd also want to help out others who are in similar situations as I am who is struggling with a, um, you know, a loved one who is suffering something that no normal medicine is not able to help cure. So I would love to be able to help people. And I think by being able to heal others and uh, maybe even having that extend to the environment, it'd be amazing to be able to heal anything that I touch. Um, so that would be just a, a miracle in of itself of an ability. So I would definitely choose healing. It's funny you mentioned that because actually the last question that I was going to ask you is where do you see yourself in the next five years? But anyway, in the next five years, I can see yourself as a shaman, uh, <laughs> maybe living as a hermit somewhere in the woods of Maine and just <laughs> gather, gathering all these medicinal plants and co concocting all sorts of cures for all sorts of illnesses. 
I can see you laughing <laughs> than five years from now. <laughs> I probably would have a lot of fun. <laughs> totally. I, totally. I am very much, as much as I go out and do pageants, everything, I am very much an introvert. Um, so I, I, it took me getting out of my comfort zone. I think pageants have helped me a lot with that, but I could definitely see myself finding that type of life appealing because of how much of an introvert I actually am. I just try not to show it that much. <laughs> Uh, we have a question from Addy Patty. Uh, mm -hmm. Name past Miss Earth title holders that you look up to. So I would say I always look up to the pageant title holders that I've met in person. And for me, Imani is who really inspired me to join Miss Earth in the first place. Uh, we were able to, we competed at Miss USA together. She is the one who really helped guide me to this system and show me that this is really the system that it best represents who I am as a person. So I really admire her. And she's one of those people who can walk into a room and just absolutely light it up. She steals the show every single chance she gets just because of how warm and funny and welcoming and how confident she is in herself. And she's definitely someone that I have always admired. She was the girl at Miss USA that I admired the most. Um, and I remember her so vividly during that time because of how much of an impact she left on me. So I know that she didn't end up winning the overall crown for Miss Earth, but she is definitely my favorite Miss Earth queen as Miss Earth heir. Um, and so I absolutely love her to pieces and i'm so thankful that she opened up uh, my eyes to this beautiful system that's wonderful mm -hmm. now um okay here's an interesting question um uh, what is your this is by the way uh one of the like trending topics lately in, in pageantry what is your position of transgendered women competing in traditional female pageants mm -hmm. Well, I think it really goes to what is the job of a title holder? And to me, the job of a title holder is to be a role model, to be someone who's seeking positive change in their community and someone who can act as a spokesperson for the organization in a respectful way. And now I don't believe that any of those uh, qualities uh, are not present in a transgender woman. I think that a transgender woman can be able to uh, fill that role of a title holder and a, just as well as a natural born woman could. Um, I will say that I do understand the different organizations have the right to decide who gets to join their competitions. They're allowed to set stipulations. As we all know, there are, you know, some pageants have height requirements, some pageants have age limitations, um, and others have limitations on whether you're a natural born woman or not. Um, however, me personally, I don't see that there is any negative part about being transgender for being a title holder and, and to be able to, you know, have that job and do it well. And I also don't see any type of, um, you know, I don't see any advantage that they would have an unfair advantage over a natural born woman within the competition setting. So I don't see it would be unfair either. So for me, I think that I would always suggest to any single woman who's competing in a pageant, no matter what your status is, is to find an organization that truly believes in who you are as a person who is going to be supportive of who you are. So I would always make you know, my suggestion is to do your research and find the organization that is going to best uplift who you are as a person and who, you know, shares the same values as you do. Excellent. Excellent response. I, I can't agree with you more. I think mm -hmm. the one issue that I have with, uh, and I know I'm, I'm going to get bashed for this, <laughs> but I really don't care because it's my opinion. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. One issue I have with transgendered women competing in traditional female pageants is that if they, when they compete, the most of the attention is centered on their being transgender and not so mm -hmm. much so on the other issues that are even far more important than being a transgender because i remember when when uh spain competed mm -hmm. as the first transgender pageant in the universe 2018 the media basically answered her questions regarding about her transitioning not so much about, about her platform actually her mm -hmm. platform was about transgenderism so mm -hmm. also, if you win a title as a transgender woman, how do you, you don't necessarily expect, like, if you're going to be like, uh, uh, you know, speaking to uh, small children, what would they think? Just imagine the situation. How would they treat you? And how would you like to be introduced to, to these children, et cetera? So I think, you know, I still have, well, it's my problem. It's my issue, I guess. I still have to deal with it. 
but those are like two concerns that I have with uh, with transgender women competing in traditional food products. Plus, they're already transgender contests anyway. I mean, if you ask, if well, you, reverse, think, you know, if you, ever, if, if you reverse the, the situation, what do you think of transgender pageants admitting natural born women? Would that be fair to you, to, to, the, trans, to the transgender organization? It's the same concept, so. Yeah, well, I think it really is down to the fact that anyone who is a trailblazer in any way, shape or form is always going to get a lot of attention on what makes them different, what makes them unique. So I do understand that your concern is that they would focus so narrowly on this one thing that really isn't their whole picture. It's not you know, being a transgender woman. That's not all that they have. They have so many glares and depth. They're just the same as any other woman. And they have the right to be able to speak about anything uh, that is about themselves. And I think that they should be able to speak more about, you know, what their platform is and, and you know, who they are as a person and in their intellect rather than just on the one subject. But I do think that that is just part of being a trails blazer in any type of industry. I know that uh, my good friend Emma, who competed at Miss Earth USA with me, was one of the first plus size girls to be able to make the top, you know, 10 or top 20 in a, a national that. pageant. And of course, a lot of the media focus is going to be about her size and, and about her being a trailblazer for women who look like her. Uh, but I know Emma personally is just this amazing, amazing woman who has so much depth to her. Um, and so, yes, I applaud, you know, her standing up for that one and championing that one thing that the media has made uh, the center focus on who she is. But I think that she, just like any um, other woman who has an identifier, is so much more than just that one thing. And I, I think that that is more something that the media needs to fix going forward and not focus on that because I think it should be up to someone's choice on what they want to focus on as far as the story that they tell about themselves and you know that could just be one small part of the person and 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 everything else is what they would like to show in in their work that they do in their community so I, I think that it really is about having the media ask the right questions of those women rather than excluding them because that would be the only questions that they would be asked. Do you think though that, um, do you think that beauty queens or title holders should express your political opinion during their reign? I think that as role models and as women, uh, I think the main purpose of pageantry is to be able to give you a platform and a megaphone to be able to speak about the items that are near and dear to your heart. And one of the things I really love about the Miss Earth USA system is that they have never shied away from allowing women to express their opinions on political and current events. In fact, there was even one that part of my state title holder reign that really was a, a big moment for me where I truly felt that I had found the right system for me because when the Black Lives Matter movement hit our country, a lot of pageant systems told their contestants not to participate, not to say anything, not to show how you stand on that type of uh, a platform. But the Miss Earth USA system had a meeting with all the state delegates. They talked about uh, that they wanted to make sure that us women and women of the 21st century have our voice and are not having that taken away from us. It is so important as women that we do have the ability to use our voice, especially on the platform now that we have had. But they also talked about how to do so in a respectful way as a title holder, as someone who is representing more than just themselves during that year. And they also gave us tips on how to stay safe if we wanted to participate in those um, in the marches and even gave us ideas on how we could help that might not be on the front lines, but such as clean, hosting a cleanup where the marches took place that evening or the next day. Um, so there was a bunch of information that they shared with us that I made me feel truly supported and heard as an individual, not just as a pageant contestant. And I truly loved that the Miss Earth USA system gave us that opportunity to express ourselves and how we felt about uh, the political atmosphere that was going on in our country. Um, what is your, you know, Miss Earth has a, um no makeup round. What is your take on, on that? Are you ready? I to, love uh, that. So I actually <laughs> almost never wear makeup except for pageant uh, uh, things. So I know looking at my social media, you probably wouldn't notice that because I, I do put on makeup for you know social media. I put on makeup for pageants. 
But in my day-to-day life, I almost never wear makeup. And I personally feel my most beautiful when I do have no makeup on. In fact, when I was at Miss USA, I participated in the, they had a no makeup challenge in the 2016. That was just for a photo shoot for a few select girls. And I was the first one to volunteer for it because I feel so beautiful with my bare face. Um, And I'm really looking forward to that section of Miss Earth because of that, because I think there's nothing more beautiful than a woman in her natural state who is confident in who she is as a person. Oh, comment from Shayna Lacey. Shayna, sending you all the love from elite Miss Florida Earth pageant. Oh, hi. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Shayna. I think she came to one of my cleanups, actually, oh, did when she? we were down in Florida. <laughs> okay. That's wonderful. Now, if you could create any reality TV show, okay, mm-hmm. and it was guaranteed to air uh, next month, what show would you want to put on TV? Now, I've actually talked with my friends about this, how I would love there to be a reality show about contestants on their journey to a national pageant, because I feel like we don't really get to know the girls in the same way um, as, you know, the fellow contestants get to know each other. Uh, And also there's so much work that each one of these ladies do within their hometowns that we don't end up getting to see in the same depth. So I think it'd be really amazing to have a reality show that showed all the lead up to the pageant rather than just that one night, because I think that that would give us a much more clear picture of who these women are and what they are doing in their community. And I also think that in the United States, unfortunately, there isn't a positive association to a lot of people with pageantry. So I think by opening up the curtains and letting them see these women uh, who are actually making difference in their communities and what they're doing and what they stand for, it could help shift that narrative and give the respect to pageant title holders in the United States that I truly believe that they deserve on a national level. Can you, oh, well, maybe 10 years from now, can you see yourself like appearing in, let's say, Real Housewives of San Diego? No. <laughs> no, I would say the only reality show that I would want to be on is Wipeout or The Floor is Lava or something that's like an obstacle course type. I would, I would be so excited to be on something like that, but that would be the only reality show that I would personally want to be on. I don't really like drama. I'm not very, uh, I don't have a lot of friends that have drama. That's just not part of my life. And I feel like that is a big part of most reality TV shows. But with those ones that is more about, you know, you know, going over obstacles and physical uh, labor. And I'm a big athlete myself. So I always really wanted to try doing over the wipeout course. So yeah. I that would be the only reality show I'd be on. And honestly, I hope you see me on one of those in the next five years. I'm going to be applying to them as soon as I'm done with Miss Earth USA because I have always want to do it on my bucket list and they just brought back wipeout. And so my dreams have now been restored and I might be able to do it someday. <laughs> well, speaking of sports, Missy, let's play <laughs> games, okay? Okay. Game number one, you know the games, this or that. You know, everybody loves to do that, okay? Almond milk or soy milk? Hmm, I actually don't drink milk in any form, but I'd probably pick soy milk because it's a little more environmentally friendly. (laughs) Okay. Satin bedsheet or silk bedsheet? I'd go with silk. So everybody loves silk. I love silk. (laughs) Squirrel or chipmunk? Chipmunk for sure. Chipmunk is what I always consider my spirit animal. So definitely a chipmunk. (laughs) You know what? Um, I have like gazillion chipmunks living under my house. They they bury themselves, like burrow themselves. Really? Once in a while, I would feel them run across the driveway. Like, what am I going (laughs) to do? I had a a chipmunk that was very friendly when I was a kid. That would I would come home from school and it'd come sit on my shoulder and just hang out with me. And it was like the weirdest thing. It was a wild chipmunk that just like loved my family and would always come and hang out with us anytime we were outside. So that's why I loved him so much. His name was Chippy and he would end up bringing like his babies to meet us and everything. So we had like a bunch of generations of chipmunks that just like were really friendly and always wanted to be around us. So I love every, them so yeah, much. Every, so cute. I, yeah, every furry animal is cute, actually. Yes, I agree. Well, what about this? Tarantula, which is furry, or scorpion? 
I have to go with a tarantula. You know, I'm actually not that afraid of spiders. Um, I'm more afraid of ladybugs than I am of spiders. And really? the size, like oh. you said, a tarantula is fluffy and furry. So uh, they're kind of cute. I'll give them that. <laughs> Mopping the floor or vacuuming? I actually don't have a vacuum. So I'd have to pick mopping the floor. <laughs> okay. iPhone or Samsung? iPhone. <laughs> California or Maine? Uh, what season? <laughs> <laughs> if it's winter, definitely California. I don't like the cold. But if it is summer or fall, 100% Maine. Okay, that's fair. Canine companion or human companion? Oh, canine, 100% for sure. Uh, <laughs> I My dog Milo is like the most important thing to me on this entire planet. So I definitely had to pick canine. <laughs> Wait, don't you have a significant other? I do. And my dog two, is funny. Though. I have a I have a little story about that. When we were in our bad car accident, it was me, Jamie, and my dog. And the first thing that I said when I came to after the accident was, Milo! And, and Jamie was like, what am I, John? And I was like, yes, my dog comes first. And he always will come first. And my boyfriend knows that. And he loves that because... I probably Milo would come first for him too. He's just such a great dog. <laughs> well, you know, dogs are more loyal, you know, they're human. But... <laughs> <laughs> you know. I don't know. With these ones, maybe, maybe Jamie might be a little more loyal than Milo is because Milo like... can sometimes pick another dog or another person and he goes, hangs out with them and avoids me. But Jamie always sticks by my side. <laughs> Game number two, what kind of environmentalist are you, Marissa? Okay. Question number one, which of these vacations are you most likely to take? A, a volunteer trip to clean up a third world country, or B, mm -hmm. an adventure to a tropical eco-friendly hotel? I'd probably pick the first one because for me, traveling is always about the culture. And I feel if I was out there helping a community, I would really get a firsthand view on their culture. And plus, when you're helping people, interacting with people, it's always so much more memorable than if you just go to a beautiful place. I remember people and food more than I remember any type of aesthetics. So definitely I'd pick the first one. Great. Question number two, are you mindful of your food choices based on the environment? A, no, I eat what appeals to me, or B, somewhat, I try to eat locally, sometimes organic. I was always eat organically and locally as often as I can. And like we talked about earlier, I even pick, if I have to eat meat, I do make sure I pick the meat that has the least amount of environmental impact and working on my way to being able to be a full vegetarian. So I definitely think that I take the environment into consideration with my food choices. Good one. Question number three, do you recycle? A, yes, and I encourage everyone around me to do it. B, sometimes I think about it. All the time. So anything that can be recycled, I always recycle. Um, in fact, one of my good friends, she even has the recycling symbol tattooed on her uh, wrist. Really? And okay. she's the one who really got me into doing it and taught me a lot more about what can and can't be recycled in California. And she's always giving me good tips for the things that cannot be taken away in a recycling bin, where to actually bring them off to recycle. So 100% yes. Nice. Question number four, what type of community service project most appeals to you? A, volunteer at daycare, B, beach cleanup, or C, volunteering at a forest preservation site? Ooh, it had to be between the last two. I mean, I put together beach cleanups and trail cleanups every single Saturday, so it's definitely not something that I you know, shy away from. I have my own trail cleanup organization called We Clean Trails, but because I do that all the time, if I had to pick between those to do something different, I would do the forest preservation one just to be able to add something new into my volunteer resume. Awesome. Question number five. How much trash do you dispose of per week? A, one bag, two, two bags or more. So personally, I do probably one bag. 
But like I said, with my cleanups, it can be anywhere from like 10 to 12 <laughs> bags per cleanup. So that's per week. Uh, so it can be quite a lot, but it's because I'm cleaning up after other people, not just the wastes I create myself. Cool. <laughs> Last question. How much of the food you eat is processed, packaged, and not locally grown? A, all, B, about one half, C, none. As little as I possibly can. So I won't say none because I know that there's always exceptions, but I'd say it's much closer to that than half um, because I try to make sure that I cook everything from scratch. Uh, I love to cook. Uh, so I definitely try not to get processed foods and any type of packaging I get. I always try to look for the one that is the most easy to recycle. So such as a cardboard box versus plastic. So I do make very conscious decisions when I am shopping for my groceries. Perfect. Game number three. Would you rather, would you rather the aliens that make first Ooh. contact be robotic <laughs> or organic? Organic. I think AI kind of scares me a little bit. So <laughs> I think the organic aliens would be less intimidating. <laughs> I agree. Would you rather be in jail for a year or lose a year off your life? Hmm. Well, it depends if I would have a record or if I actually just get to go to jail. Uh, if I had a record, I'd probably take a year off my life because with my work, I can't have a record. Um, but if I was able to just go to jail and not have a record, I would 100% do that because I would take a lot of time to focus on education um, and reading a lot of books. So. <laughs> Good answer. Would you rather be married to a 10 with a bad personality or to a six with an amazing personality? Well, marriage is 100% a partnership. So you want the person who has the best personality and who's gonna be the best teammate. So I would take the best uh, partner over someone who is the most good looking person in the room any day. But luckily I don't have to choose because I have a really great boyfriend who can kind of check both boxes. <laughs> Wonderful. Would you rather be able to talk to land animals, animals that fly, or animals that live under the water? Land animals specifically so I could have my Milo talk back to me because I talk to him quite a lot. I think he can understand me, but it'd be cool if I wasn't just talking to myself all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, who is that crazy lady talking to herself? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather spend the rest of your life with a sailboat as your home or an RV as your home? You know what? I got to live on a sailboat for about a month off of the coast of Puerto Rico when I was doing my shark tagging uh, project. And I've never gotten better sleep in my life than in the rock of the boat. So okay. I would definitely pick the sailboat. Awesome. Would you rather be the first person to explore a planet or be the inventor of a drug that cures a deadly disease? The inventor of a drug that cures a deadly disease, for sure. I think we kind of covered that before. I'm not about to go to Mars anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you compete in Miss Universe, then you get to compete against Miss Mars. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Would you rather be able to control animals, but not humans, with your mind or control electronics with your mind? Electronics, for sure, because I believe all living beings should be able to have autonomy over their own bodies. Uh, so I would think that it'd be another form of animal cruelty if I was able to do that. So that kind of makes me hesitant to say that one. So definitely the electronics. Good answer. Last one. Would you rather be forced to dance every time you heard music or be forced to sing along to any song you heard? Now, question. Do I automatically get good at dancing or singing or is this how I am right now <laughs> just how you are right now <laughs> okay you know what let's just go with the dancing so I already know how to sing but if I was forced to dance all the time maybe I would finally figure out how to not have two left feet so I would go with that one <laughs> okay well you also bring calories right it's a good exercise exactly it's another form of exercise <laughs> yeah. last game Miss Marissa give me a wrong answer okay Question number one. Marissa, tell me, why do fools fall in love? Hmm. Fools fall in love because, you know, logic is just too easy. <laughs> okay. That's the wrong answer. I take it. 
Question number two. <laughs> What is the quickest way to get from California to Maine? Walking. Okay. That would take like forever. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I've driven a it month, it right? Forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I read a story once of a man who walked from north of Alaska all the way to the tip uh, of South America. I believe like Chile or Argentina. Yeah, I was like, it took him like a, over a year. Like, how did you do that? Okay, to each his own. Marissa, how do you make spaghetti sauce? With sugar. <gasps> I, love <laughs> I know that's a really controversial sauce. thing. A lot of people put sugar in the spaghetti sauce, but absolutely not for me. <laughs> you know what? If you try your know, Filipino spaghetti sauce, it's very sweet. Because Filipinos really? love sweet stuff. So they add a lot of sugar and hot dogs. That's the Filipino spaghetti, hot dogs and sugar. <laughs> really? Yeah. All right. Well, sorry if I offended anyone. <laughs> no, it's no, just no. too sweet for no. me. <laughs> like too sweet for you. Don't drink, drink a lot of rainwater afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Marissa, when are you getting married? Uh, tomorrow. Ooh, have you sent out the invitation to everybody yet? No, we're just eloping. <laughs> That's fine. Email to recycle. <laughs> Marissa, why do dogs and cats fight? Because they're trying to decide who's cuter. Ooh, okay. Of course, you're going to say dogs are cuter, right? <laughs> oh, 100%. But that's also because I'm really allergic to cats. So I, I have to tell myself I don't like them so that I don't go pet them and die. So. <laughs> <laughs> Marissa, baby, how do you make someone fall in love with you? You do everything that they that you that they want you to do. Okay. And that's the like reason why babies. that's the wrong answer is because then they won't be falling in love with who you are. You need to be exactly who you are, and the right person will love you for that. Okay. Marissa, when will the world end? Never. Okay. Because time, because time is forever. Time is forever, <laughs> right? It's continuous, like a cycle. Last question, Marissa, baby. Okay. Who is going to win Miss Earth 2021? Lindsay Coffee. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> but back to back, we didn't know we needed. Back to back. Oh my God. <laughs> like, did, did you see? Did you see her winning reaction? By the way, it was like. Yes, I did. I got to watch it. Like, <laughs> She's like, is this for a reaction? Is this real? <laughs> It's like, wow. Oh, Lindsay's so sweet. You know, honestly, I wish that could be a real answer because I wish that Lindsay got the opportunity to go compete in person and get to know different girls from other countries because I think that's such a huge part of the experience. So I wish that could be a real answer for her so she could go and get that experience and I'd wait a year so she could go do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't want to compete I love her. against her. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think, didn't she go to Belgium to crown the Miss New Belgium Earth or something? Yes, I, I heard she right? did. Yeah. Yeah. So that was her, I think that was her first real travel as a title holder, I believe. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's great. Now, do you have any information about as to when Miss Earth 2021 will take place? I wish, but unfortunately, we don't know anything yet. Um, I know it'll probably be sometime between October and December, from what I'm hearing. Um, and they're hoping to be able to have it be as, much of an in-person pageant as possible from what I've heard. So they are working to try to find a really safe location for us. So I think that we might just have to wait a little bit longer. We'll see maybe after Miss Philippines Earth, if they make an announcement, that's what I'm hoping for. Um, but you know, in the meantime, I'm just really hunkering down and trying to work on everything I need to work on in the meantime and uh, get ready for this most amazing opportunity. So I'm really looking forward to it. But yeah, I wish I had a date and I wish I had a location to share with you. But as of now, I don't. Now, have you been to the Philippines? I have not. And that's been a bucket list item of mine forever. I'm really hoping that it's able to be in the Philippines this year just because 
the Filipino fans and pageantry is unmatched in my opinion to anything else. And I just have received so much support and love from everyone in the Philippines. So I just want to say salam up po to all my Filipino fans who have been supporting me along the way. And I really hope that I get a chance to see your amazing hospitality in your home country. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed because the Philippines is my my, you know, my wish list item for where Miss Earth would be held is my number one choice if I got a tick where it was going to be. Um, so I'm really hoping, holding out hope that we'll be able to go there and reunite as our pageant community in the Philippines this year. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Filipino, Filipinos love you. They, they, I know they love <laughs> Lindsay, you know, and, and I, I, I think most of them want USA to win like back to back. No. Really, yeah. That's so sweet. So, I really appreciate that so much. You know, I mean, you never know. It could, it could happen. Now, um, as far as like preparations, do you already have a gown or an, what about a national costume? Have you thought about that already? Those are all in the works. I can't share too much about it, unfortunately, it's under okay. the guidance of my team. But we are already in the works on both my national costume, which I'm very excited about that one because my mother is very involved in the creation of this. And it's something that she's actually has been you know, collecting little pieces here and there for it for about two years now, just hoping I'll be able to get to go to Miss Earth. So she's very excited that she, uh, all the work she's doing is actually going to pan out to become this amazing national costume. So I can't wait for you guys to see it. It is going to have a message that's related to my advocacy, the collective earth. So I'm really excited to share that all with you when I'm able to publicly, but it's going to be beautiful. And Pixton Design is the one designing uh, my national costume and putting that together. And we did just meet with Ashley for uh, my my evening gown as well. So Ash looking Ashley forward Moran, to I love her. Yeah. So yeah, her, yeah. We, yeah, we did go there and start discussion of it. So it hasn't started production yet for the gown, but we just started putting together ideas on what I'd like to be seen. And um, it's my last pageant gown ever. And I think it's gonna be the one that is gonna be the one with most sentimental value. So this is really great to be able to be part of the creation of this a unique gown. So really excited to share it with you, all of you guys as soon as I possibly can. But for now, I can't give away too many hints. <laughs> yeah, my friend Jan Michael who lives in the Philippines says, hope to see you here in the country. So good. I yes. would love that. Even good if. Here. Even if it's not held in the Philippines, I'm going to try to make it to the Philippines at some point, you know, while I'm still Miss Earth USA, because I would love, love to be able to go and say thank you to everyone who has been supporting me and been so kind. And I honestly have never felt this much warmth and support leading up to any single pageant I've been in. And, and the amount of support and love that the Philippines has been showing me is just I'm so absolutely blown away. So I have to, as, as soon as I possibly can, Go to the Philippines. That is the first international trip I'm going to take on my own. Okay, listen to that, Filipinos. Okay, Marissa <laughs> will go to the Philippines. Okay, and I want you guys to treat her as royalty, like you oh. always do with all your beauty queens. Okay, okay, okay. Last question Are you going to return that dress to Vanessa? Um, you know what? She told me to keep it. So it might okay. go to my next friend down the line oh, okay. on our rotation. So we'll see. I'll have to talk to her before I give it off to anyone else to see if she wants it back. But from what she told me, she's, she's done wearing this one at this point. <laughs> oh, she's done. Okay, that's one yeah. Listen, I can't thank you enough for allowing me to interview you. I know, I think I've tried to, I've tried to connect you, to connect with you like for like months, ever since you mm -hmm. won uh, Miss Earth USA. And, you know, because of your business schedule, you know, but I, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Miss, Miss Earth USA organization for allowing me to interview Marissa. I had a good time. It didn't feel like an interview to me. It felt like, you know, we're, we're two friends just basically chatting with each other, talking to each other, getting to know each other. So I, I really like that. And I wish you the best of luck, girlfriend. Thank I know you so you much. Will, you will rock that stage. You will represent the US of A with a lot of pride. I'm telling you now. And the whole world is waiting for you. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity. I had so much fun. Thank you for asking me such an interesting, uh, dynamic questions. And I think this is a great you know, practice for me as I go into Miss Earth. And I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to your fans and for you to have me on your page. So thank Wonderful. you so much. <laughs> Good luck. I'm sending you a virtual hug, virtual kisses you know, the whole virtual stuff and everything. <laughs> <laughs>
go eat dinner, girl. Thank you. And Thank go you. walk Milo. <laughs> <laughs> and have a cookie. <laughs> I want to upload this video later on and I'll tag you so you can, you can watch and share it. Okay. Perfect. Have a wonderful Thank evening. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> have a good night. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.